Warning, you are now entering a diversity zone where different opinions are tolerated. This is not a safe space. This is Pillow Talk. G'day and welcome to Pillow Talk. I'm Dave Pillow and today I'm joined by Emilio Garcia, deputy editor of The Unshackled and host and presenter of Front and Centre podcast. G'day Emilio, how are you? I'm doing just great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure. Now you're coming to us from the exotic location of Mexico City today. Tell me a little bit about Mexico yeah. City. You're a Mexican, uh, native, correct? Yes, I'm half Mexican and uh, believe it or not, it's not really very, uh, very exotic here. It's actually more just like a normal developed city. Very cool, very big. Uh, having a great time so far. Excellent. Well, you've uh, made it sound like I really must go there to to visit the um, location. So we'll we'll definitely have to do that. Uh, maybe you can give me Absolutely. a guided tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever whenever you're here, man, I'm happy to do so. So, uh, are Mexicans generally in favour of the wall? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, no, no. Uh, obviously, Mexicans are uh, greet the wall with quite a bit of, of apathy. Obviously, we. We see it just kind of like a huge middle finger right uh, right along the Rio Grande. So, no, <laughs> no Mexicans aren't super happy about it. And what's your uh, personal opinion? Um, what, do you, what do you think are the issues involved? Um, and then your, your side on it. I guess um, to stimulate your answer, I think um, border control, uh, national sovereignty mm-hmm. are, are critical issues. Um, whether or not they solve any other problems beside that. I mean, Australia can't relate. We just can't relate because we do have a massive wall all around our nation. Um, border control is a lot easier for us than most other nations which share a continent um, with other nations. Um, what are the issues that, that you think are at play here? Well, the issue with the wall, I mean, there, there are several points and I won't go off on a tangent, but essentially there are several points to it. First of all, is that it is the least efficient answer. Now, there are several countries, including Mexico, that have built walls to keep immigrants out. Mexico has a wall on its southern southern border right now, and it's actually expanding it as we speak. So when Mexico kind of has that negative reaction to the wall, uh, it's kind of strange, right? Because we're keeping some of the uh, poor uh, South American countries out. However, these walls, and you know, a lot of European countries have them as well, were built before modern technology. They were built before we had all of these rules that would let people move freely from country to country. And so what the wall does is it's throwing a huge amount of my money, of taxpayers' money, to something that is really not quite as efficient as many other technological options could be. What do we know about illegal immigration? We know that, first of all, There are more Mexicans leaving the U.S. than coming in. Most of the immigration to the U.S. is from Central and South America. Naturally, they have to go through Mexico, but Mexicans aren't the problem. Second of all, most of the people that are living illegally in the United States didn't cross the Rio Grande. They didn't sneak into the country through a place where there was no physical barrier. They overstayed their visas. They got there on a boat. They they went on a cruise where maybe they didn't have permission to leave the boat, and they just stayed there. There are several things that, that, that they have done to get into the country that have nothing to do with crossing the border by foot. And another thing is that once you build a wall, the enforcement of those many, 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 many kilometers, the second longest border in the whole world, is virtually impossible. How are you going to have the manpower to make sure that every single inch of that wall is protected? Well, you can't which means that people can get over with a ladder or rope. It just seems more than anything, from my point of view, it's not so much a moral issue. It's an issue of practicality. I do think that there are uh, many, many things that that we can discuss when it comes to illegal immigration. And obviously a country has the right to decide who does and doesn't come in. But throwing money at a border wall seems silly to me. What are some of the solutions that you think would better um, establish or assert um, border control, um, national sovereignty of, of being able to choose who does and doesn't come in. If the wall is a waste, but the value is 
or the issue is is justified um, what's a better way to make sure you've got integrity along that second longest border in the world well i think one of the things that you can do definitely is change the way that you give working visas to different countries right now the, the way that it works is that the same amount of working visas are allocated to every country equally so mm -hmm. if you think about it mm -hmm. luxembourg has the same amount of working visas available as China. Obviously two very different population sizes. That's for so that people that want to come from Luxembourg or China to, to the US, is well, that what you're talking about? Yeah, right. so it, the, the issue is that it's, it's, it's equal against uh, among all countries mm -hmm. that you know, have any eligibility to come to, to go to the US to work. Mm -hmm. You know, the US really does need a lot of these Mexican workers. There are certain yeah. areas where Americans are just not going to work. Mm. So why not create a more adaptable visa model where you can get people that desperately want to work from Mexico, Central America, South America to the jobs that, that the United States needs to be filled. And that in its own way can curb illegal immigration. I'm sure most of them don't want to be brought in with coyotes. Most people that try that are either caught, many die in the process, Women are raped uh, when they're trying to cross the border with, from uh, what they call coyotes, which are the people that uh, bring in people illegally to the United States. They're what Australians so, call people so. smugglers. Exactly. And yep. no one wants to go through that process. It's dangerous and it's, uh, it's something that can leave someone traumatized forever. And ultimately, the possibility of you getting in isn't 100%. Why not allow... For, immigration isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as they are vetted individuals who share the morals of the land that they're going to and that add something to society, we want them here, right? We want, or there. Uh, yep. So the United States has a lot to benefit from allowing uh, people from Central South America and Mexico to come in. Uh, they're just not doing it very efficiently. And the way uh, uh, to fight this illegal immigration isn't to cooperate less with Mexico and build a wall. It's to cooperate more with Mexico and expand visa opportunities. That's my point of view. Okay. Now, you actually talk very inclusively of America. Um, so just to clarify for my viewers who may not be familiar with you yet, um, you're half Mexican, currently in Mexico City, but you've been an Australian yeah. resident for a year. And you're actually, are you a, a US taxpaying citizen there? Yes, I am. I'm actually originally American. I was born in uh, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and I was naturalized as a Mexican. Okay. Very but, good. Uh, yeah. And uh, Los Angeles isn't a very safe place for, to be a conservative. And yeah, no kidding. Um, <laughs> it, it definitely, uh, it's definitely one of the more lefty uh, spots in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, this is where you notice, though. Uh, that, that was actually an invitation to clarify that you're not a conservative, that you're uh, a uh, centrist. Yeah. Yes, I am centrist, and uh, people tend to think that that either means that I'm a fence sitter or a secret liberal or a secret conservative. But I will say... <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that let me tell you something. No one gets called both a cuck and a Nazi as much as, they, as, much as I do without being an actual. Just pick so. a position. Just pick a position, Emilio. It won't hurt. Well, I think the issue is that I do pick positions and I take very strong stances on different positions. And some of them are very far to the left. And I'll be called yeah. a cuck for it. And then some are very, very far to the right. And yeah. I'll be called a Nazi for it. So I, I just choose not to be chained to one uh, ideology. Look, that's a, that's a great segue into uh, an article yeah. you've written recently um, about the, the lack of tolerance from leftists. Uh, the, the throwing around the word Nazi um, is, yeah. is um, sort of betraying their claims to tolerance, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And this is where we, we were talking about this earlier, where we draw the distinction between leftists and people on the left. Mm. Because there are people on the left that are perfectly rational, polite people. They just happen to have uh, a certain political ideology. Leftists are the Antifa crowd. The leftists are the people that, you know, if you're not, you know, e eating vegan hummus and checking your privilege, you're a Nazi. And, <laughs> or if you're not woke, which they call, which is, Woke is supposed to mean that you're awakened and that you're like more cultured and intelligent. Yeah. So probably Further evidence of leftists' uh, poor grasp of both grammar and definitions. 
Exactly. Like, <laughs> you just, please don't call yourself woke. Just show yourself, just show other people how intelligent you are. <laughs> it's not it's working. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, I mean, one of the things that is happening now is that essentially the, the left has this, the leftists have this claim to total objectivity and to know what's right. And they have reached the moral high ground the way that no one else has. And so they have the right to scream someone down mm. and to ruin their life if they believe that they don't adhere to their points of view. And so when they talk about tolerance, they're actually not tolerant. They're just accepting of various groups. What I mean by this is they say, they think that they're tolerant because they have no problem with gay people. They think they're tolerant because they have no problem with trans people or with black people or with you know, Muslims, all of these things. That doesn't make you tolerant. That makes you accepting. If you are, you know, you have, if, if, you, if you can have uh, friends of all these denominations, that makes you an accepting person. I, for example, I'm accepting of all these people. I'm tolerant of people who have ideologies that I don't agree with. I have to tolerate them. Yep. That is what m- would make me a tolerant person. Same with you. I think, you know, you have me on your show. And we have very different political ideologies. Uh, we actually had a pretty heated debate about uh, the gay marriage debate but we are tolerant of each other's ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, yeah, that is what, what separates the left from the leftists yeah. or the conservatives from the far right conservatives. Because essentially there are people that, are, that have their, their, uh, their ideologies and they can be more far to, the, to, the, to whichever political ideology they are. They can be more to the center, but they respect other people. Yeah. Leftists don't. That's and right. And for them to say that they're tolerant, I think is just ridiculous. Yeah, look, the the definition of tolerance is to be able to suffer somebody you disagree with or find uncomfortable. Um, exactly. And to accept what you're saying is to not just permit them to be in your space and conversation, but to actually embrace them, um, to actually endorse them. Um, and and I, I'm not sure if, if, you know, it's good to be able to clarify what we mean by different words. I'm not sure if if I'd put such a big difference on those words, uh, but I'd say you're neither tolerant nor accepting if you can't even, uh, you know, countenance somebody's different opinion. If you can't even listen to it, hear it, absorb it right. and respond in a non-personal, uh, non-character assassinating way with <laughs> assumptions such as racist and homophobe and Islamophobe and bigot and hater and no, right. hang on the reason I disagree with you is actually because I care. It's actually because I think there's a better idea and there's a better way of doing things. And I want you to benefit from it. I want that person. I want everybody to benefit from these ideas. If I hated uh, to me, the most hateful behavior is indifference uh, to, to not care enough to comment. Um, And uh, yeah, so that's uh, so what about this, uh, this you, you, note, you note in your article that a group who calls anyone who disagrees with them a Nazi and uh, subsequently pon- punches them is, is far from tolerant. Um, is, it, uh, is, is this uh, tolerance the new excuse for violence? Uh, I suppose so, at least within their, within their narrow-minded definition of tolerance. Uh, I mean... Obviously, right now, uh, the definition of Nazi has been expanded to a dangerously huge amount of people, correct? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I remember there's this, um, I was talking yesterday to uh, the host of the Andrew Clavin show, Andrew Clavin. Great. And I'm jealous. A Nazi. Did you interview oh, him? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I did yesterday. Oh, nice. In, I can't yeah, wait to yeah. see that interview. Watch out for that interview, Emilia Garcia Cruz with Andrew Clavin on Front and Center. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, he's he's a very intelligent guy, and yeah. he has obviously some uh, some very controversial opinions. But you know, the guy himself was Jewish. Now he's Catholic, uh, but he gets called a Nazi all the time. And, and in between, don't David. forget, he was atheist. He was Jewish, oh, yes. then atheist, or, then Catholic. Yeah, then Catholic, right? Yeah. Uh, but to call him, for example, Milo Yiannopoulos, who I'm no fan of, I'm not sure what you think, but I think uh, he's basically you know the scum of the earth. He's a uh, a total bastard. Oh, but no, not, no, I don't hate him. Um, there's bits I can yeah. take and bits I can leave. Yeah, I don't hate anyone yeah. uh, to be that, that. That's the leftist job. I, uh, <laughs> I just think, <laughs> so uh, true. 
<laughs> that, that's that's the tolerant left. <laughs> exactly. Uh, he's purposefully divisive, and uh, so what I can say is that I don't like him. Yep. When I categorize him a Nazi, well, no one because he has never said a bad thing about uh, about Jewish people. He himself being Jewish, by the way, mm. and. It, it, it's just so dangerous when you actually do have neo-Nazis out there in the ecosphere to then brand anybody who is ideologically different to you a Nazi. Yep. It just, it sets such a dangerous precedent. Yeah. The, the issue is right now, you can't label everybody you disagree with a hateful extremist you must, you know, silence. Before we used to say, you know, David Duke is, you know, the, the Nazi that, you know, the standard of Nazism. He's a bad guy. He, you know, he's extremely racist. That's someone that we can label a bigot. Yep. Now, anybody who, who says an objective truth, which is uncomfortable to certain people, they're now Nazis. They're now hateful extremists. And it's my responsibility now to go and beat the shit out of you because I believe that I'm doing this for the greater good. That's extremely, extremely worrisome. Let, let's talk about some things we might disagree with uh, from your Twitter timeline. I'm going to hold you accountable for your tweets now. Um, you've you've uh, commented on the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that it's been revived because the the 11 nations have, have gone back in. So your comment was, of course, right. this would happen. Trump didn't kill the TPP. He just separated the US from its its benefits. So tell me, are you a fan of the TPP or do you have any criticisms of it? Well, I do have criticisms of it. I think that certain countries went into it that have nothing to win from it. Uh, certain poor countries uh, like like Mexico, uh, they're in the TPP and they're going to get railed by it because they're essentially allowing, they're going into direct uh, competition with countries that have less regulations, uh, smaller wages and uh, more productivity than they do. Uh, but essentially, I think that the free market is always going to be the best way to solve all the world's ills. There are certain things that countries are good at and certain things that countries are bad at. Yep. Right now, what we're doing is we're playing to the strengths of each country. Each country will export what it's best at producing. Yep. And, and the, the citizens of those countries benefit from it. They now have higher quality, lower cost goods. Their quality of life increases life increases and they have more disposable income, which grows the economy, which grows wages. I think that that's just a no brainer. So do you think right that's now, a result of the TPP or do you think that's the way yeah, things are without yeah. it? Uh, no, I think that that's, that the TPP is going to, is going to make that, uh, is going to make that happen. You know, it encompasses a huge percentage of the world's GDP. And I think that it's just a natural, especially for Australia, for example, uh, you know, it is so hard to import things to Australia. There's so much red tape that, consumers end up paying gargantuan amounts of money for mm -hmm. things that in other countries are extremely cheap. I mean, uh, you, should, you should see how much an avocado costs here. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just... Uh, oh, in Mexico? Good. Yeah, yeah, it's right, probably right. Like about 25 cents. Uh, okay. So lots of idea, smashed avo in Mexico. Yeah, lots of smashed avo, exactly. <laughs> but essentially, what, what the issue is, is that, yeah, I think that, I think that Trump uh, really, really kind of screwed the pooch on that one. I think that it also gave us a level of uh, penetration into the Asia Pacific market. Well, us being the U S mm -hmm. a level of influence in the Asia Pacific market that we've been wanting to establish uh, economically is obviously always the best way to go. And now we've kind of opened the floodgates to allow other countries to take uh, that power, whether yeah. it be Russia or whether it be China, we've basically yeah. let go of uh, a, a huge opportunity all in the name of appeasing, uh, you know, 38% of the country. I thought it was ridiculous. I, I agree with you and I disagree with you. Uh, I agree with you on free trade. I'm a huge free market fan and, and advocate. And mm -hmm. I don't, just for anybody who wants to start throwing stones, I don't think it's uh, a perfect utopian system with no ills. I think it's the right. best system the world has ever seen. Um, and, and that doesn't equate to the same as perfect and without things that we can improve. Um, the right. problem I have with TPP is that it's not mm -hmm. free market. It's increased economic regulation. It's globalization. It, it's not global market. It's globalization. And it leading to an increase in, in government and the disparity of power between governments and citizens. It's leading to, uh, you know, increases in control for the, the, 
the globalists to control things such as the minimum wages in, in other nations. I really don't give a rip what any other nation or citizen or government or unelected bureaucrat has to say about our labor conditions here in Australia. And for that to be a condition of free trade makes free trade just a Trojan horse for globalization. But it also includes um, things like, in Obama's own words, it includes things like education standards. Um, I, you know, we're having enough trouble with the government imposing their doctrines and their values on our children without increasing that scope of, of regulation beyond our own bureaucracies into other nations' bureaucracies. What this is, is heading towards, it, you know, there are heaps of benefits to free trade. I agree with you 100%. Mm. Um, and, and for nations to be able to specialise their workforces in what they're especially good at is fantastic for those nations and increases their markets and increases the, the prosperity and power of every individual on average, certainly, um, mm -hmm. in, in those nations. But the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a smokescreen called free trade in the name of and real agenda of, of globalisation. Um, and, and so that expansion of, of state power is something that I oppose vehemently um, without being opposed to free trade. Uh, you know, and, and opponents of free trade, uh, uh, th there's this reductionalist criticism of them that says that they're simply, um, they're simply against freedom. They're, they're protectionists. They're, they're only interested in, in monetary um, you know, oppression of, of other people. And I was like, well, no. That, that's really, really not understanding the the deeper layers um, to this Trans-Pacific Partnership. And, and I think that's why um, Trump got out of it, not because he's protectionist, although he may be, but because he's um, for America interests first, not letting other nations um, dictate terms and conditions uh, of, of unrelated issues such as minimum wages and education in, in America. Right. If, if America wants to have low wages to increase mm -hmm. um, participation in its workforce for people who otherwise wouldn't be worth the wages that are demanded, then, mm -hmm. then that's America's business. It, it shouldn't affect mm -hmm. another nation's willingness to, to do business, um, to import and export with America. Fair enough. So uh, what I will say is uh, th those criticisms, I'm not saying they're not valid. I will say that I think that uh, the, the U.S. and countries like Australia, uh, Canada, the ones that are more developed, would see very little of these uh, conditions uh, set on them. One of the things that had happened is that a lot of countries were not uh, participating in <coughs> free trade with other countries uh, with very poor education, with very poor labor laws because of the situation in which people would work. So we basically didn't want to be importing, you know, that, that's why we had so much, why Nike had so many issues, you know, they were uh, basically creating their product in such uh, bleak conditions that it just basically wasn't palatable for them to keep doing these things. And so uh, politically, it was very dangerous for them to, uh, to create a free trade agreement with countries that had basically such low uh, standards for their, for their workers and such low standards of uh, even even basic human decency mm. uh, while they were working and producing for richer countries. So as I understand it, what they did is basically give them a timeline uh, to which they can finally adapt to something that is at least more palatable to Western countries. Essentially, Walmart uh, isn't going to be able to, you know, go to uh, one of the smaller, um, to some of the smaller Asian countries that uh, have so many, um, so, there's so few regulations rather, and be able to treat their workers like garbage just because they are so low skilled and so um, and have such low salaries. They yeah. basically have a timeline to which they can reach a point where it's palatable and where we think that their human rights are being respected enough that we can then start trading with them in a reasonable way. And I don't think that that's unreasonable. I think that uh, the same way that we don't have any right to go nation build, they have the right to say we're not going to be part of this specific uh, of this, uh, you know, uh, free trade agreement mm. because we don't want to meet those uh, those regulations, and I think they have every right to step away. But we're going to say we are not going to allow you to continue to send us all these products that have children's little hands uh, all over them, or that have you know 
uh, sweat and blood all over them. But, but see, if you're a free market advocate, you've got to say the market yeah. is the solution to that, not increased government power, increased regulation with a whole lot of globalist globalization uh, agendas tied with it. Mm-hmm. So I'm all for improving the working conditions, uh, you know, but when we say we're not going to uh, allow you to do free trade with this, what you do is you isolate that country and uh, Worst, you know, and you, you also actually remove jobs from those people. Um, yeah. The free market the is, is the way to to actually um, be, because no job is a worse outcome for those people than a terrible job with terrible conditions, um, living in abject poverty, yeah. and and we we can't even you know contemplate it. And again, you've got this globalist leftist agenda that that mm. says things like um, cheap power is a curse upon the earth and must be stopped. Meanwhile, they're cursing right. entire nations of people to live without electricity at all, which is Im- imposing um, in, in our, you know, interventionalist, um, imperialist kind of, of environmental fashion, we're imposing mm. poverty on those nations, like, like Bangladesh, where they have to burn cow dung and things like that to yeah. to heat their homes and the particulates from that get in and cause all kinds of health problems and incredibly reduced right. um, life expectancies all because we're trying to save the planet under dubious research meanwhile actual right. people are dying in their droves now and today and to to pretend that you're interested in the outcome for people when you're ignoring the outcomes for people um, that are inconvenient to your narrative is very disingenuous but you know environmental um, mandate is another one of these conditions that are um, imposed and and caveated to the the tpp it's another way where we're ceding um, policy to overseas interests that they get to dictate to us our education our environmental policies and our labor policies it's like hang on do you want to do business with us or not what happened to the word free trade without conditions, without qualifications. And and now let the market say, hang on, um, through the power of free pe- press and free speech, if Nike is going to you know, manufacture those, those shoes with the bleeding fingers of two-year-olds, then we're not going to buy Nikes anymore. If Apple's going to make iPhones um, where people would rather throw themselves off the roof of a building than live another day in this factory village, then we're going to prefer to use other things. That's the power of people. Right. Um, and that's liberty. <laughs> that's freedom that I advocate yes. right. and that I'm for. Not ceding that power and that responsibility to our government or other governments, w- e- even worse. Yeah, no, listen, uh, I obviously, uh, I mean, what you said, you've kind of unpacked a lot. So obviously, it, that's one of the great quandaries of uh, of free trade. You know, obviously, uh, it's it's one of the harsh realities that maybe isn't uh, very politically correct to say even you know that that ten year old boy who is earning fifty cents a day mm. those fifty cents a day are important to him right or to her to the family and that 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 essentially is allowing them to to get ahead and to say that we're not going to trade with them anymore is actually making them worse off not better off yep I get that but at the same time this is not um, First of all, this is a political game, and second of all, they are they are expand they are finding ways to expand their interests abroad. So clearly, there right now there are interests regarding uh, environmental policies, policies that have to do with paying people a certain wage, uh, policies that have to do with um, with the way in which people and the conditions in which people work. So as politicians and as countries looking to advance their uh, their objectives abroad is what they're going to do. Now you have basically two trains of thought. You have one train of thought, which is countries have essentially the right to, to, to impose or to seek to um, expand their interests abroad in whichever way they see fit, uh, as long as they're not, you know, intervening or taking over a country uh, with brute force. And another, another one would be that they actually have absolutely no right to do that, that every country is completely sovereign and that they should have, um, that they should have no say in what other countries are doing, if they want to tr- trade freely with that country, and they should do so under the uh, the regulations and the standards that they hold themselves. I happen to uh, to agree more with the first point, but I'm not saying the second point is completely invalid. However, if you're looking at what Donald Trump did, he actually reduced his uh, ability to impose his interests abroad. 
uh, the United States interest abroad and it's letting foreign players that are not necessarily very in tune with Western culture and Western ideals uh, take over those interests. And I think that sets a very dangerous precedent. So sometimes you kind of have to decide which way are we going to go? What's better for the country? What's better for, uh, is it better to impose our, um, our standards on other countries or allow other uh, more nefarious countries to do what we fail to do? Some, some uh, interesting points there. And I wanted to um, uh, let you have the last word on that because I did throw so much at you. Um, but let's, uh, let's pivot to another topic in your Twitter timeline right now. Uh, and that is uh, a couple of tweets from you um, a few days ago. Trump isn't the most pro-life president in history. Many conservative presidents have been pro-life their whole life. And uh, Donald Trump was pro-choice not that long ago. Fair point. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if the longevity of his views diminishes the strength of them. Um, arriving at the truth late um, and then backing it strongly is uh, is a is a good um, and laudable thing, but um, just the one other uh, tweet from you on that topic. You've made it clear before that you're pro-choice, uh, or I've made in your words, I've made it clear before that I'm pro-choice only because I believe the consequences of illegal abortions are so severe. Pro-lifers and I will have very different legal slash moral points of view, but most of them are good people who believe they are defending humans' right to live. I like uh, I like your position. Um, or okay. let, let me uh, let's not say your position. Let, I like your posture, um, and again, distinguishes <laughs> you from a leftist um, because okay. you're actually tolerant of other people's views. And I think it's you know I, I um, also give people who have the opposite view to me, being pro-abortion, that mm. that um, they even do try to categorise it as pro-choice because there's this. Uh, let me. Let me say this um, probably hostilely. There's this facile okay. or shallow appreciation for for choice, for for liberty, mm -hmm. and and I and I do mean that critically and negatively because I think it fails to see beyond the first level that there's actually more than one one person involved. Um, but let's deal with your first tweet. That first of all, that that Donald Trump isn't the most pro-life president. Can you think of any other president who's done more? for the sanctity of life subsequent to Roe v. Wade. To be fair, um, you can probably only um, compare with presidents in, in that last, is it 45 years, I think, yeah. since the Roe v. Wade decision. Well, I mean, here's the thing. Obviously, uh, it, it's, it's incredibly hard to, to uh, fight a Supreme Court decision, correct? Yeah. So th that would be... Uh, Even if it's point. a terrible, terrible, terrible legal, historical, constitutional decision. Right. Well, that, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of a separate point. Uh, yeah. No, it was... Essentially... It was a cheap shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but essentially, listen, I think that there have been uh, conservative presidents that have kind of allowed... That have given more power to uh, the states and allowed them to impose restrictions that they see fit on, uh, on you know, uh, abortion clinics and things that have basically... Uh, drastically reduced the amount of uh, abortion clinics that are available and thus have reduced uh, women's ability to get an abortion. So I would say that uh, the George W. Bush, for example, saw also a, a, a huge movement uh, in terms of state rights to limit the number of abortions had. Mm -hmm. So right now, Donald Trump, to be fair, uh, not that I'm defending his position because I, as I've said, I'm, I'm not uh, pro-life, but, um, but the, the issue is that he just hasn't done enough right now to say he is the most pro-life president in the world. Obviously, Mike Pence is going to go out there and say that because he kind of needs to, you know, uh, play to his ego because Donald Trump is an egomaniac. I think even his fans would, would agree to that. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's my only point. You know, I was saying that while Mike Pence was giving his, his speech, I was pointing it out. Yes, right now it seems that Donald Trump is pro-life. It seems yeah. that he, the policy that he's going to follow in the future will be that way. But to call him the most pro-life president that has ever lived might have been a little bit premature. Do you think? Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's what I was getting at. Yeah, sure. I'll take but that. And that now we're going to move into the second point, which is where you're saying, well, how can you morally justify being pro-choice? Yeah. If you know that it is not a moral action, right? 
Yep. And something this this is something that obviously I have to fight with because it's it's a constant struggle of both sides of my mind. One being the the policy decision that I think just creates the least amount of harm in society, and the other being that I know that abortion is essentially uh, ending a human life, and that that there is nothing moral about that. Mm. So. The only thing that I will say is that I've seen uh, statistics that uh, have been try- that some people try to refute but aren't very concrete. That whenever people's ability to um, to get an abortion is reduced, we see a higher number of uh, illegal abortions, abortions that are tried to be induced medically that have horrible conflict uh, consequences for the mother. Uh, also, you know, illegal abor- kind of what they call alleyway abortions or uh, um, you know. Uh, what do they call it? The ones that are done with hooks and back alleys. Those are obviously extremely coat dangerous. Hanger. Mm. Yeah, coat hanger. That's that's the, that's what I was looking for. Mm. And obviously, I think that that's extremely dangerous. So what I want. So the point of view that I'm trying to take is that at this moment, just because there is such a tremendous lack of culture when it comes to uh, the practice of safe sex, and you know, right now there's obviously a, a hookup culture and all these things that that have made. Uh, unwanted pregnancies just um, you know go go completely out of control. There's also a lack of knowledge of uh, uh, birth control and contraceptives that allow women to you know basically you know be their own uh, sovereign person and conduct themselves sexually however they want. Yep. Uh, but then end up obviously suffering consequences. And uh, for me right now, there is just no better alternative uh, socially than to allow uh, these these people to get an abortion because then there's just all of these. You have all the issues with uh, unwanted pregnancies having to take them to term. You have women not taking care of themselves, not taking the proper vitamins, not uh, not consuming the uh, you know not consuming alcohol, smoking all these things that uh, that have terrible outcomes for the baby. And it just seems like right now the unintended consequences of illegal abortion are far outweigh the the opposite uh, end. However, I think that if we could start moving towards teaching, first of all, that there is a morality. And there is, are strong consequences to having a pregnancy that you have to terminate. That is not a casual thing, as so many people try to frame it. Because mm. some people are like, oh, if you get pregnant, nah, no big deal, get an abortion. No, I mean, it's a horrible thing. Don't try to, I mean, I, I'm not saying that necessarily the, the women are, are taking on an incredibly immoral stance, because ultimately, maybe that's the only decision they have at the moment. Mm. But let's not, let's not pretend that it's just something casual that you do, and then you move on with your life. Yeah. Many women the consequences emotionally of that for many years. And let's also teach people how to copulate responsibly. Uh, I think <laughs> that, that also has to do with uh, ending sort of this whole thing of you're, empa- you're an empowered woman if you hook up a lot, which is bullshit. Yeah. You're essentially giving, uh, you know, you're basically kind of less of a feminist because you're just giving the men everything they want and kind of like sacrificing your own uh, yeah. sexual activity as a woman, you know, sexual uh, pernicity as a woman. Yeah. Uh, so that's another thing that we have to work on. So that's the, that's the way forward, I think. I want it's, to see. It's actually an exceptionally good plan to end up with an unwanted pregnancy. Exactly. Exactly. It, it, it's not uh, knowing the height how. of stupidity. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, you have a bunch of irresponsible sex with like, yeah. a bunch of random strangers, yeah. and don't get educated, and then you know. <laughs> what's Look, really I, the the problems I have with your argument, and and again, I like your posture and and the the good that mm-hmm. you're seeking to to have as the best outcome but I, I don't think there's a worse outcome possible than in america alone and you know a, a tenth of this in australia um, but in america alone it's a million babies per year that are killed deliberately i, I don't think there is a worse outcome yeah. than that um yeah i mean you even take the demographic breakup of those million babies right. alone and um, compare it to the demographic makeup of mm-hmm. of america itself and, and the populations anywhere and it's genocidal uh, it's always mm-hmm. minorities that are disproportionately represented and grossly so um it, it's it, it was the intent of the founder of of um, planned parenthood margaret sanger to um facilitate and support a eugenics agenda by um, promoting abortion especially in minority communities in america she was a huge fan of Hitler. Um, as you rightly identify, abortion is steeped in ethical problems and gross right. immorality. Um, but the, you know, what is the worse outcome than a million babies in America and a hundred thousand in Australia being deliberately killed by their mothers every year? Uh, it's, 
it's a horrible mm-hmm. comment on society. And I think it's, it's the most um, obvious, most numerically damaging uh, moral issue that we have in the world today. It's not climate change, the moral humanitarian crisis. It's the wholesale slaughter of our unborn children um, under the names of healthcare and reproductive rights. Right. Uh, you know, and you know this 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 sovereignty, this body sovereignty argument um, neglects the question: whose body ends up in the bucket? Uh, and if you've you've seen the video um, li- released, um, you know recently, I think it's by Live Action. They're showing people mm. who are pro-abortion choice on the street videos of what an abortion procedure involves, and they all right. change their mind. There's this gross lack of information, and and information is power and empowerment. And and so it's it's a transparent lie that feminism and planned parenthood and abortion is all about empowering women when most of them don't even know what's involved in the procedures, even in the first trimester, when they see the videos of, of an abortion, they go, Oh, well, I'm not sure I'm pro choice anymore. In fact, um, I find it very hard to support that. You, that's, that's not right. right. You can't do that. Your, your thoughts. Yeah, on, I mean, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I mean, there, there's obviously, um, I mean, there, there have been tremendous, uh, medical advancements in how abortions are made. And so in the first trimester, they're actually pretty safe and pretty um, non-invasive. Uh, most of them are even medical. Uh, but that's really not the point. That's beside the point because yes, uh, obviously a lot of, uh, especially when the, when the fetus is more developed, the, the uh, process is far more, uh, far less palatable. Let's say that. But way. what but these videos reveal yeah, is that people yeah. underestimate how developed the fetus is in the first yeah. trimester when abortions are most often funny. happening. Right, but that shouldn't even play a point. That shouldn't even really play out much of a role. I mean, just because it looks more like a human, less like a human. I mean, the ultimate, uh, what that ultimately will become is a human. So, what does it matter if it's a little round thing or a little tiny baby? Hang on, uh, let me stop you with that language. Maybe it was accidental. Yeah. Maybe it was deliberate. Um, it won't become a right. human. It's no other species. It human, right. it, it's a human from it conception. It a, a self-thinking human that will contribute to society. Let's mm. let's put it that way. That's what that's kind of what I tried to say. Maybe my wording was off. But essentially, you, but, but you even even that, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt um, you. It yeah. Just mm-hmm. the, like those other qualifiers that you used, um, mm-hmm. the lack of those, you know, aren't necessarily devaluing the infant either. You know, sentient and contributing. Um, that's mm-hmm. they're not reasons to to abort a, right. a person, are they? Exactly. No, no, no. Like what what you're saying it, is essentially people that have disabilities that that doesn't uh, that doesn't allow. Yeah. Listen. Dave, right now we're, we're getting into a discussion that maybe need not be had because I agree with you on all these things. That's, that's, that's my point. I'm not saying that I disagree with you morally. Obviously, the conservative uh, pro-life argument intellectually always will take home the gold, okay? Because this is a human life that's being ended. I'm not going to pretend, I'm not going to cover my eyes and pretend that this is a, a point of view that doesn't create incredible incredible uh, internal conflict with me. I'm not happy about my choice. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go too far to one side just because it would be more comfortable for me. I have come to the mm. decision that I've come to and to the opinion that I've come to because I have seen the data that is presented to me and I have just reached a point that I think logically makes the most sense regardless of the fact that I don't agree morally with this. And I think that there are several things that we. So can you're talking do about the harm to women it. if they self-abort, if they do a coat hanger back alley, yes. illegal, other thing like yes. that. Yes, and not only that, not only that. I mean, also you have. Can the, I test your Can I test your logic on that? Yeah, sure. Um, if a woman wanted to kill her two-year-old child, and right. regulating that provided better safety to the woman. Um, as opposed to the risks she may face by killing her child by herself if the child was two years old, would you right, right. would you try and say that legalizing and regulating and safely administrating the murder of a toddler was justifiable yeah. by avoiding the harm to the woman? Right. No, absolutely not. Of course not. Uh, obviously, I think that you can put you can you can obviously uh, put um, a child uh, a toddler into uh, the the system where uh, into the foster system where you can't really uh, foster do the foster system for a for a fetus and again 
And the thing is that right now you are, uh, you're going to uh, throw several uh, ethical quandaries at me and, and obviously, ethically, the, the argument for abortion will never win. Mm. Ethically, it will never win. I mean, and so we can go back and forth on this for hours and the arguments, the moral arguments for abortion will always lose. Always. Yeah. The issue is that the societal impact to me is obvious. And even though, uh, even though what we're saying about a child that is maybe two years old versus two months old is still human, frankly, the societal impact that I see from having to carry unwanted pregnancies to term or from women trying to self-abort or women trying to get illegal abortions just are far too far reaching and terrifying for me to support complete blanket uh, illegalization. So rather than, than try to pick apart um, my very, very complex uh, moral decision for being pro-choice rather than pro-life, I would say there, the issue is that both points of view exist, okay? And it's almost going to be impossible to get someone that's on this side to agree with someone that's on this side. So how in the world are we going to fix this? It's almost an unwinnable fight because it brings up so much vitriol and so much emotion to talk about this that it's almost impossible to reach middle ground. And it, and it needs so, to. We, we need yes, to be, to. We need to be um, both dispassionate and coldly logical uh, about yeah. right and wrong. Um, hard laws, hard cases make bad laws. You know, so, yes, but at the same time, there's something wrong with this if we're not emotional and upset by the genocide of a million unborn children every year. Um, we, you know, yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be the, surprising or, or a criticism yeah. if somebody's emotional about it. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 no, no. yeah. People, are, people kind of try to try to try to paint uh, pro-lifers as uh, ignorant buffoons that are just, you know, yelling nonsense, but no, they, they couldn't be further from the truth. The, the problem I have with your, your logic is, for. is that it seems inconsistently applied based on the location of the child. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, right. Um, and I think the dispassionate logical approach needs to be, well, hang on. you, you, I, I disagree. And I think this is, this is just subjective, but because plenty of people will disagree with me. I think the worst outcome is death, not suffering. Okay. Um, and, okay. and there's plenty of people who will take the opposite for that. Um, you know, if, right. you know, but, um, but to, I also think you're underestimating um, statistically, and, and I understand why, because um, it's such a PC topic that the research and data is suppressed and certainly not widely published in the mainstream media. But the data and the statistics on the harm to women from abortion is, right. um, look, my, my understanding, and, and perhaps we should compare sources and compare research, but um, right. it's far greater for you know one in one in three women over the age of 40 in the western world has had an abortion and most of them are the walking wounded with silent mm -hmm. invisible wounds that they're not allowed to even acknowledge um the rates mm -hmm. of ptsd i mean i know of people right. women in their 70s who are getting counseling for the grief and the trauma and the emotional psychological wounds they have carried for decades unacknowledged right. and unresolved as a result of, of killing their children. And, mm -hmm. and my sympathy is for those women. My, I, I don't condemn those right. women. I, I think they are victims of abortion. If I hate anything, it's abortion. I don't even hate abortionists, right. the people doing right. this killing. I think, I think, you know, if we're going to talk about good laws, I think women should never be prosecuted for having an abortion, but abortionists should definitely be um, prosecuted. Yeah. The same well, as I think, yeah, well, he's right when he agrees with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I thought ego was the way to be Donald Trump, but um, right. <laughs> so, you know, I, right. it's just like any other murder in my books. Anybody mm -hmm. that facilitates okay. a murder should be culpable for it. Um, and, okay. and yeah, I definitely see women as the victims here. And, and that's the point I'm making is that if you're, right. if your goal and your argument is for the greater good, for the least harm, then mm. I, my assertion is the best way to minimize harm and maximize social good is to yes. make, make abortion, um, socially repugnant, um, illegal right. to provide. Um, now, okay. for, for those people who are, who are watching, um, 
abortion is a direct abortion is never medically necessary. There's a, a thing that you can look up and Google. It's called the Dublin Declaration, where over a thousand obstetricians, gynecologists, midwives, and and other associated um, professionals who are charged with the care of women have have agreed and, and signed this um, declaration that they are always for saving a woman's life and direct ab abortion has never um, been necessary to save a, a woman's life. And, and here's the difference is that um, delivering a child prematurely necessarily, even if the odds of survival are really, really low to save a, a mother's life, isn't an abortion. There's, you know, medical invention, intervention and cesarean delivery. And it's even evident by the language that you choose. We're going to, we're going to have to deliver the baby. We're going to have to take the baby out. But abortion basically says our intention is to end this child's life. Um, right. and, and that's, that's unconscionable. Um, so, you know, have a look at the Dublin declaration. If you've, if you've never seen that yeah. before, it will blow your mind um, compared to oh, the yeah. narrative. Yeah, listen, I, haven't, I haven't seen a lot of, a lot of the things that you've cited, but I have, I have done my research. And uh, again, uh, we, uh, we agree, I think, in more points than, than this uh, conversation would, would. But it's boring to agree. Because, let's focus on the disagreements. Yeah, let's focus <laughs> on the disagreements. Essentially, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's always a, that's always a good point. But right now, the, the thing that I will say is that I believe that when properly implemented, there are better ways to curb um, abortion mm. rates that will appease both sides. It won't appease both sides completely. And I think that pro-life advocates have every right to continue to chip away at people's right to get an abortion just the same way that uh, pro-lifers will always uh, continue to in intend to expand people's mm. possibility. But if we can start doing something that is fighting the root cause rather than fighting the method, then we're going to get some real results. Well, so I think we can, we can walk and chew gum well, at the same time. I think I think we should yeah. um, overturn bad laws, um, but mm -hmm. not at the neglect of of implementing um, better culture, um, better value of life, better value of right. of women's health. Um, I think you're absolutely right. There has been perhaps a dominance of of focus on the baby alone and not the woman right. um, for a few decades. But in in recent years. Um, the argument has been better articulated. And I think the concern was always there, but it just wasn't part of the, the rhetoric of the pro-life campaign that, hey, abortion hurts, uh, kills a baby and hurts a woman every time, every time. They, um, you know, quite often. Uh, it, so, so, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. We have to focus on, look, how can we help women who who must be empathized with in difficult situations. One of the um, mm -hmm. things that has to be entered into the, the conversation and the dialogue is if you're a feminist, how can you not acknowledge that abortion is used as a weapon of domestic violence frequently where, yeah. where women who are just so afraid for their relationship feel obliged yes. and compelled and are obliged and compelled by their boyfriend, de facto husband, um, male partner, mm -hmm. Uh, to go and have an abortion or else he's going to leave her or else he's going to, you know, induce it himself with violence. You know, mm. there's, there's parents. Um, it might be through cultural shame or through, you know, right. other things that force women to have it. There's heaps of women who've had an abortion who didn't want mm. it and were forced to by the people right. they thought loved them. I mean, this, the, the welfare of women has to be one of these conversations that we're having about why, there needs to be more information about abortion. And, and again, I, I agree with you, perhaps, um, you know, that fixing the legislation isn't the only, certainly isn't the only strategy we should be doing. We should be providing more information. In fact, I, I refuse to call uh, the pro-choice campaign pro-choice anymore because it, it's actually better characterised as pro-abortion choice. Uh, what we need to be doing is saying, hey, let's talk about all the other choices that are available as well. You know, you can have mm. pre-birth adoption where you actually have right. the, the ability to choose the parents that will love and raise your child and they get to be involved exactly in, in supporting you through right. your pregnancy. So if you can't afford the, 
the prenatal care, the vitamins and, and those they things, can. then right. then you get the have are we talking about these other choices very option very yes, very often. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is this is Dave what I think the more productive conversation generally is. I agree. Because, it's it's about to get boring. It's so much <laughs> you know, yeah. No, because uh, the other one good, will, good, will good. always be a back and forth where no one will ever be satisfied. Mm. When we start to talk about solutions, that's when it can get a lot better. So, for example, in Australia, obviously, there are a lot more safety nets than in the United States, right? And so a, a woman... In, in places? In, yeah, in places. Uh, pro, yeah, probably so, some places are a little bit more nanny state than the others. Yeah. But in some places, a woman who doesn't really have a lot of money will probably say, because of the safety net that is provided to her, that she may be able to have this child without it ruining her economically for the rest of her life. Mm. So for example, she won't have to choose between taking care of the child and going to college because the government mm. ultimately pay for your college and then you have to pay them back once you're making a certain amount of money. There's yep. also access to childcare, all these different things, which make it far more viable to, for you to say, you know what, I, I have this child, maybe it's not what I wanted at some point, but it's alive yep. and I need to take care of it. And yep. if it's my choice to be the one that takes care of, take cares of it, takes care of it or her yep. or him yes. rather, then, and it's better to have certain things in place that will allow me to do this while not having this be the only thing that will happen in my life for the rest of my life. That is a much better solution than to say, well, yep. let's talk about morality for hours because yep. where are we going to get with that? Let's talk about what we can do to help yep. women actually be able to keep their babies yeah. or maybe not keep them, but have them stay alive yes. and go on and live their That's life. That's right. Yeah, look, pro-choice has to be pro-real choice, not pro-abortion mm -hmm. choice. Um, and you right. can't have a re real choice if you're operating under lack of information or misinformation. Uh, you know, right. one of the worst things about the abortion industry, and it is a profitable industry of death, is that they perpetuate this myth that you can become unpregnant by having an abortion. Um, right. And, and it never happened. It, like you don't have reproductive rights once you're pregnant. You have exercised your reproductive right. You had sex. Exactly. 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 That yeah, was you exercising exactly. your reproductive right. What you're wanting now, or what they're arguing for now, is a destructive right. And there is a life. There is a human, and it is alive. And to to change that, you have to be destructive. And the hormones won't stop and the emotions won't stop. You don't become magically unpregnant when you have an yeah. abortion. You have to deal with all of these things. And if you're not given this information and this reality, you can't make a real choice uh, about the many options that are available to you. And and so even, even just changing the culture and the information and the public education around, you know, abortion counseling, um, sorry, pregnancy counseling places need funding. The only places that are attracting uh, funding at the moment is uh, the abortion procedure with a Medicare rebate. And, mm. you know, whether you have a miscarriage or, or a, an abortion, it's the same Medicare uh, number. So the numbers are probably right. conservative of abortions in, in Australia. Mm -hmm. But when you have an abortion, it's mandatory that you have counselling. Guess who has to provide the counselling? The abortion provider. Guess how much funding there is for the counselling? None. Guess right. how much funding they get if their counselling doesn't revo result in an abortion? None. There is no incentive. It's a gross conflict of interest to have counselling about this procedure, which is in the criminal code in, in some states, rightly so, right. um, because it should be highly, highly regulated um, to protect Absolutely. women. Um, there's this huge conflict of interest about this significant thing that's far more important and impactful than having a mould removed. Yeah. It's like it's like getting business coaching from an insolvency provider. They have no mm -hmm. profit profit until you until you make the only decision that they make profit from. Uh, you know, so we need to have funding and support for for the pregnancy counselling um, places yeah. who will provide support for women, who will provide them with other yes. choices and other options. And there's there's this huge statistic of of and I won't pick a number because I don't remember it exactly, but. Uh, it's a it's a large number of women, if not a majority, uh, who wouldn't have gone ahead with their abortion if they had have felt there was another option, another choice, and any yeah. other kind of support. Um, so y your point is made well, and we agree furiously that um, that there needs to be a lot more That's effort put into into the other choices that are available. 
Absolutely. And that I promise you is something that most pro-lifers and pro-choice will be able to agree with. Yeah. You, you have disagreements on the legislation and on the morality, but something that I, 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 I think there are very few people of will say, no, I don't want there to be any other alternative. I don't want to have a mom have the ability to keep her child. I only want abortion. I do. Yeah, yeah and, that's right. Uh, this is how we move forward. Yeah. Oh, there's so much more information I can talk about that I'm deeply passionate, as you can tell, about um, of course. about women's health and um, and I think the evil of the profitable abortion industry. Um, I mean, right. even just knowing that most pregnancy counts, counseling places run off of um, volunteers and fundraising as opposed to government funding gives you a big clue about the the ethics and the agenda right. behind behind each perspective. Um, but I have uh, yeah. uh, it, uh, indulged myself of your time for just about an hour now. So uh, right. thank you very much. Tell um, all the viewers okay. who've enjoyed this conversation and prefer perhaps a view that's slightly less passionately conservative than mine, where they can uh, catch Emilio Garcia Cruz and Garcia Cruz and uh, the Front and Centre podcast. Absolutely. You can get the Front and Center podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get all of my content on frontandcenter.net.au. Subscribe. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm always on the Unshackled website as well and the Unshackled Facebook. So please keep tuning in. Fantastic. Emilia Garcia Cruz. Do we, do we say your whole name or is it just Emilia Cruz or is it the, the two Emilia dads? Emilia Garcia, Emilia Cruz. You can call me Absolutely, whatever. As long as it's not cuck or Nazi, I'm happy. <laughs> I won't call you cuck or Nazi. Emilio, it's been great having you on and uh, look forward to talking to you Likewise. again soon. Absolutely. Have a nice day.